I'm very happy to have you here. My name is Kara Ballou, and I am a senior advisor with the Texas Public Policy Foundation, and we have some wonderful state leaders to talk about um, school finance and the upcoming legislative session. I want to point out that this session is CLE accredited by the State Bar of Texas, and you can to get CLE credit, you must sign in on the clipboard on the front of the room. Um, with that, I would like to introduce our esteemed panelist, Representative Dan Huberty. Can you raise, <laughs> everyone know who he is? <laughs> he recently served on the Texas Commission um, for Public School Finance. He served in the Texas House since 2011 and in the 85th legislature was named the Chairman of House Committee on Public Education. He served on the Committee of Public Education each of his previous session and as the chairman of the Subcommittee on Educator Quality in the 84th session. In the 84th session, he was approached by Governor Abbott to carry House Bill 4, which created a high-quality opt-in grant program for pre-kindergarten in Texas. The bill successfully passed overwhelmingly the House and the Senate. We also have with us today um, Chairman Scott Brister. He recently served as Chairman of the Texas Commission on Public School Finance. He's currently a partner at Hutton Andrews Kurth LLP and has been there since 2009. He previously was a Justice with the Supreme Court of Texas from 2003 to 2009, Chief Justice with the Supreme Court of Texas from 2001 to 2003, and spent 20 years in various litigation and author roles. He authored, authored articles in South Texas, Baylor, and St. Mary's Law Reviews. He graduated cum laude from Harvard Law School and summa cum laude from Duke University. And finally on stage we have with us today, I'm not gonna pronounce your name correctly, I'm so scared. P say it. Sauger. Sauger. <laughs> um, Sagar is here, he's the Chief Operating Officer of Commit Partnership um, in Dallas. He has led the incubation of several regional efforts including Best in Class and Dallas County Promise. He currently leads a coalition of statewide partners that advocate for policies that will create better outcomes for students across Texas. Better outcomes is something I deeply care about. He's led technology, he led technology st strategy and development at Inside Track, an organization focused on improving college graduation rates through personalized student coaching. He's an alum of the Mayor's Star Council and of Leadership Dallas. He received an MBA from the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University and graduated from the University of Texas at Austin. So, very happy to have such an esteemed panel. Oh, and Senator Ta Chairman Taylor, do you want to come up? <laughs> You're going to hide? <laughs> I'll go ahead and kind of set the table for every, um, everyone in the room in case you are not familiar. Um, the legislature passed a bill. Hello, Chairman Taylor, and welcome. Good afternoon. <laughs> Um, the legislature passed a bill to create the Texas Commission on Public School Finance, and it was a 13-member commission. Um, the commission had members that were appointed by the governor, lieutenant governor, speaker, and the state board of education. And I thought, very importantly, six of the commissioners were actually members of the Texas legislature. So we really had great um, leadership on the commission. Um, participating in the decision making. The commission focused on improving student outcomes, school finance revenue streams, and expenditures. The final commission report was released very recently, December 31st, and it was titled Funding for Impact, Equitable Funding for Students Who Need the Most. So with that, um, Chairman Taylor and Chair uh, Chairman Brister and um, Huberty, all were commissioners on that panel. And so we have the people who actually worked on writing this tremendous report on stage here today to talk to us. And I will introduce Chairman Taylor. 
So, Chairman Larry Taylor, Senator Larry Taylor, was elected to the Texas Senate in 2012 and previously served five terms in the Texas House of Representatives. He currently serves as the chairman of the Senate Committee on Education and is a member of the Business, Commerce, Higher Education, and Budget Writing Finance Committee. In 2017, he was appointed to the Texas Commission on Public School Finance. He owns Truman Taylor Insurance Agency in Friendswood, in Friendswood, an independent agency started by his father more than 50 years ago. And so now, Let's get into asking some questions. Um, I'm going to start with um, Chairman Brister. Chairman Brister, taxpayers are spending $60 billion per year on public education, or about $11,000 per student. The Texas Commission on Public School Finance heard that some school districts are getting good results within existing taxpayer resources. Given that some school districts are doing good right now, should the state spend more money on public education? Uh, well, uh, I guess the question I have in response is uh, uh, for what? Um, whether we should spend more money on education um, to get basically the same results is, uh, I don't think anybody's for that. Um, part of the, well, two things. One, so, the, you mentioned the focus on outcomes. If uh, the problem we have to some degree in public education is a problem of large numbers. There's five million students, 350,000 teachers. So what normally has happened, at least you know, my experience is in school finance litigation in the past, and uh, schools come in and ask, they, you know, tell the legislature they need to give us more money. Um, and the <clears throat> problem is it's, uh, I have a long list of things, uh, that uh, they want to spend the money on, some of which would be good, and some of which probably not going to make any difference. For example, take 350,000 teachers, you give everybody a $3,000 raise, that's a billion dollars. Now, a $3,000 raise for most teachers is about a 5%. And if you, you have about the same number of support staff, administrative staff, uh, teachers' aides, particular specialists in various areas, give them all a $3,000 raise, that's $2 billion. It's $2 billion a year forever. And so the question is, so, so what are we going to, does that mean that more low-income students are going to be able to read at grade level? And you know, no, nobody really thinks that's the case. It, it certainly helped the teachers. I mean, I'd rather have $3,000 than not. But um, so the focus of the commission was on what we get for. And I'd say the main point I'd want to make on this is if you, if you look at the commission's report, which is very hefty, as uh, did they say the state has to put in no, uh, more money or not, you're missing the big picture. What's truly radically different is the biggest change in 20 or 30 years in how money is parceled out. Uh, it redirects over $5 billion to the students who, meet it, who need it the most, which is what the title of the report talks about. Um, and at the I mean, there's just, there was overwhelming testimony that the best, the best thing you can do, uh, the students struggling the most, the English language learners, low, kids from uh, low-income uh, households, um, and many of them are very far behind grade level at third grade reading, and they never catch up. Because if you, have, if you can't read at grade level at, at third grade, that continues on forever. You're going to be behind forever. Uh, whereas if you can get, so the, the two of the biggest focuses of the commission, uh, the testimony was getting everybody early, er, in the early grade uh, reading, focus on low income uh, English language learners. Uh, and, and then if you could do that, so, so for instance, let's say, you know, we've got a program that uh, you get extra weight, extra funding for English language learners. But the, one of the recommendations in the commission is you give extra funding to English language learners in the first three grades. We're not going to give you just a check and you just spend it on English language learners in whatever grade you want. No, spend the money where it counts because the data is very strong that that's going to make a difference. And if we can catch everybody up, you'll save money later on. So again, to me, the, the main uh, issue is whether we're spending money well, not how much uh, do we need to add to it. Thank you. Chairman Taylor. 
Oh, that's the re well, it's a recapture slide. That's fine. Um, the commission considered new oil and gas revenue when making its recommendations, but the comptroller has recently warned that oil and gas revenue is a very volatile funding source and maybe should not be used for public education. How much do the report's recommendations cost? And does the comptroller's warning change the commission's recommendations? Uh, well, no, I, I don't think it does. We, we considered, we didn't actually go into deep consideration, but a, a multiple revenue sources. Uh, primarily, a lot of it, like, like Chairman Brister said, we're reallocating money that's already being spent in certain programs that, that aren't getting the same results that we'd like to have. So we're reallocating money, in, for example, um, some of the dual language versus bilingual. You know, they, they showed us that bilingual programs, if here's your standard, the bilingual never gets there. Dual language programs actually exceeds the standard and improves the educational outcomes for all students. So why are you spending money on bilingual when you reallocate that money that you're spending there and putting over towards dual language and improve every student's educational outcome? So there's a number of things like that in there, but as far as oil and gas, it has not historically been a proven reliable source. Uh, it has grown. Now, there's a number of things that are happening today that may change the, uh, the stability of it. For example, we are now an independent oil producing country, whereas before we've been subject to the, the whims of OPEC. And we're also in the process of exporting LNG, which provides another revenue source. If you look at the reserves they found in Texas of late, I mean, we are far superior to where we've been in the past, and I think we have more independence. But, but just, I think the main thing is, if you look at the revenue growth, and, I'm, and I had some charts, but I'm not sure they got here because it's last minute, but if you look at the growth, a lot of it's based on the growth in our overall budget. And our budget has grown over time. You know, as our uh, uh, population has increased, our revenues have increased, it's increased substantially. So a lot of that is just committing to dedicate some of that, more of that growth into education. And if you look at where we are in education today, yes, our spending per student has gone up over time, but if you adjust it for inflation, it's pretty flat. And then if you look at our demographic changes since like 2007 to 2017, I'm sorry you can't see these charts, but our low economic disadvantaged students, our lower income students has grown dramatically. It is our fastest growing demographic. Economic, economically disadvantaged. It's also our fastest, it's already our largest growth, I'm sorry, our largest demographic already is economically disadvantaged and it's our fastest growing. If you wanna change that, you've gotta give these kids a good education. If you wanna maintain Texas as a leadership in this country and the world, we've gotta make sure that all those students are getting educated. And right now, the educational outcomes for our economically disadvantaged students is far lower than everyone else. And that's our largest demographic and it's our fastest growing. If we don't get a handle on that and make that commitment to change that, we're not gonna be the same state in the future that we are today. But, but basically we're looking at a large spectrum of things as revenues, a lot of it's just commitment. And I'll tell you one more thing that we came to realize during this school finance commission is the recapture numbers. Your know, recapture when it first started was a very small number, affected very few districts. That number has grown over time and right now it's already been increasing, but by 2028, recapture will surpass our total state spending in education. That's not a number that people are gonna be willing to put up with. As part of the current school finance system that we're under today, we didn't create this, but this is what it is. As local property taxes grow and they create more wealth at home, they have more money available for the local schools, the state portion necessarily drops. So that's just the way the system is. What we're proposing is changing that system and make sure more of that money goes back from the state level to keep the local property taxpayers from having to foot so much of the bill. Following up on that, Chairman Huberty, one of the plans discussed in the report is to cap property taxes at 2.5%. Will the cap reduce or eliminate recapture? And what impact will the cap have on property taxes for the average Texan? Well, you know, when we when we t we we had three different working groups, we had expenditures, we had outcomes, and we had revenue, and they all had to work together. Um, and obviously, this is the plan that the governor has talked about. And if you sit down and you really dig into it, and you talk to them, the the, the goal is is pretty simple: is that if we don't do anything, 
um, with with the with the a revenue cap or or a, not a revenue cap but a property tax cap. But we don't do anything about that. Chairman Taylor's right. You know, recapture right now represents about 2.6 billion dollars. By 2023, it'll be at like five billion. It's 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 just exponentially growing. It's about 219 districts that are subject to that, and it'll grow to 293. The the goal of the commission was to to have the state continue to increase their share, which has been going down the other way. In 2006, 2007, and I think Chairman Brewster was on the Supreme Court at that time, um, there was a lawsuit that the, the school districts won and they compressed the tax rates. But I don't think there's anybody in this room who thinks that they got a tax reduction uh, in that period of time. And so what we're talking about doing is by looking at this, if we don't do anything with recapture, if we don't do anything about that, the state share of education will, will drop to 33%. There's bills that have been filed that we should pay 50% of the cost of, of that and things of that nature. That's a very significant number when you think about you're spending you know, about $30 billion. So that's obviously not affordable either. Um, but when we, we looked at it, we looked at how do we, how do we, we want to tackle another problem, which is you right now have almost, you have 399 school districts that are at the maximum m and rate of $1.17. I represent several of those districts, including Humble ISD, that's at $1.17. Um, if we increase the yield on the on the tier two pennies, and I don't want to get in the weeds too much, but there's two different uh, types of pennies that are out there. If we increase the cost of that, you have to you have to stay up with how inflation is continuing to grow. And so the entirety of the what what I've told people is that you have to look at the entirety of the report, uh, the over 30 recommendations, including the revenue ones, and it all has to work together. You can't just piecemeal it because it's got to work together. Um, and if we do that, effectively, you'll, you'll not only help the recapture school districts, but you'll help the school districts like mine that are at $1.17 that could let them reduce their tax rate, have the ability for the school boards, incentivize them to be able to do that and pass meaning, meaningful reforms. And I, and I think that we've laid a good blueprint to be able to accomplish that. So, move on, help the... A oh, little bit of a technical difficulty, unfortunate. Anything? Okay. I will ask the next question. We were going to pull up a slide for Mr. Desai. Sa <laughs> um, okay. Thank you. Here we go. I apologize. There we go. Okay. Mr. Desai, the report recommended teacher merit pay based on the Dallas ISD program. Traditional teacher associations, which are kind of like unions in Texas, have fought against teacher merit pay programs. How has the Dallas merit program improved student outcomes? How do you respond to teacher associations' criticism of merit pay? So I think everyone up here, and it was definitely became evident in the commission hearings, uh, teachers are by far the most significant in-school factor that we have uh, uh, in terms of impacting student outcomes. We should be treating them and rewarding them like professionals. Um, and so the recommendation specifically asks for an optional multi-measure evaluation system uh, starting at $100 billion or $100 million growing to $1 billion um, over the next 10 years that districts would be able to locally opt into. Um, and a lot of this was based off of the learnings uh, in Dallas ISD. And so just to give you a sense about Dallas ISD, it's a district that educates about 170,000 students. 90% of its students are on free and reduced price lunch compared to the state, which is about 60 at 60%. Uh, they have halved the gap with the state in the last five years. They've decreased the number of schools that were labeled as improvement required from 43 to four. Now there were a series of reforms, whether it be uh, an investment in early childhood education, um, the teacher evaluations, personalized learning schools, early college high schools, but the most significant investment was by far what they called the Teacher Ex Excellence Initiative. Um, I think that all said, um, to make something like that happen, it had to, a couple of things had to be in place. There had to be a lot of input from teachers, um, from staff administration, from community members in developing this. It had to be comprehensive um, and, and laddered across multiple layers. So principals were under this system, teachers, as well as assistant principals, executive directors. 
And then the third is that it had to be based on multiple measures. So very often when we think about evaluation systems, we're just thinking it's based on a test, based on a test, and based on a test. The reality is, is what happened in Dallas ISD is that a third, about, about a third of its evaluation is based on test scores. It's the better of growth or absolute achievement. So for a teacher that might be working with a harder to reach population, low income students, English language learners, they will likely get rewarded based on growth. Half of the evaluation is based on observations. So what we know from research about what excellent teaching is. And then the balance if you're teaching kids above fourth grade is based on student observations. Not necessarily do I like my teacher, but my teacher adapts his or her learning style to my needs. My teacher respects me as an individual. Things like that that national research has really shown to be an important component of defining excellent teaching. Um, there was definitely a lot of pushback. Um, we were fortunate to have a very strong superintendent um, and several board members that were willing to push this through and make this one of their signature reforms um, during their tenure. Um, but a lot of teachers unions at first did not like it, although we're starting to see more and more teachers um, get behind it because they're seeing the impact that it has. One example I'll give is um, an organization that uh, operates an advocacy and policy fellowship for teachers across the state, Teach Plus Texas. We had a chance to interview one of their teachers, um, and she was telling us that for the first, she teaches in a very high poverty school, and said that for the first time ever, I am being recognized as a great teacher because of the impact I'm having on my students. And now I can take a vacation. That's the type, when you really talk to a lot of teachers that are a part of the system, I'm not saying it's a perfect system, we're continuing to get better at it every single year, but teachers that are part of the system that really want to make an impact appreciate the opportunity to do so. The last example as it relates to compensation um, that, that I'll state. <laughs> That's good news because I didn't know there was an alarm. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so the, the um, I lost my train of thought now. Um, but Resume your normal activity. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that might be. Um, you know, I think that the, the big thing here is, is the, the evaluation system, oh, this is what I was going to say, is Dallas ISD did a study of, of, of compensation. And normally, most districts do a step and ladder for every year. You might get a two to $300 increase. Uh, the average 10th year Dallas ISD teacher makes the same as a 19th year teacher in surrounding districts. So this is a way for teachers to get paid more sooner and not having to wait 20 years to see about a $7,000 increase in their pay. Uh, and then the last thing is, I think, to step it above even just what, what we're talking about with merit pay, the idea here is, is an, a strong evaluation system helps define what excellent teaching is. We too, often, as, we too often don't know that. And superintendents have told me, have told others, they would love to know who their great teachers are, they would love to know who their average teachers are, and they would love to know who their ineffective teachers are, but they don't have a system to do so. Um, and so I think that what's exciting is that when done well with the right level of input and the right type of thought put behind it, it can be extremely impactful to, to impact student outcomes. Can I add to that real quick? For sure. A very clear example of what happened in Dallas ISD <clears throat> is Blanton Elementary. Uh, Bland Elementary was a school, a small elementary school, not small, it was an elementary school that had been failing the state like six out of the last eight years. This is an 80% plus low income school district. They were passing about 40% of the kids were meeting standard. Within one year of implementing this program, identifying your best teachers, paying them more, identifying principals and paying them more the best, they went from 40% to 80% passing in one year. What, yes. And within two years, that 80% plus lower income school was surpassing Highland Park Elementary. So these are the kind of programs we're talking about. These are significant gains, and these are exactly the population we need to be meeting and make sure they're getting educated. So when we talk about some of these programs, those are the kind of things we need to be funding. And I, I guarantee you this, you tell the people of Texas those kind of stories, they'll be willing to help make sure that happens, because that's what we have to have happen in Texas. That's wonderful. Uh, the results really are remarkable out of the program, so hats off. Um, I'm sorry these got a little out of order for some reason. Okay. Um, 
Here we go. So, Chairman Brister, one of the novel and key report recommendations was that was recommended, um, I actually found this really fascinating, was incentives to be paid to school districts for certain student results. Why were the incentives recommended, and is there any concern that schools that don't get the incentives are going to be harmed? Uh, well, like all merit pay systems, the people who don't get the bonuses are not going to like it. Um, that's the way it is. And <clears throat> this, for instance, the thing we were just talking about where Dallas, I mean, it, it's, it's remarkable, but think about it, you know. Basically in a region, uh, uh, teacher's salary tend to be stair step. How many years you work, that's what your salary is going to be. They're all kind of uh, more or less equal in the region. Now, if you're an outstanding teacher, you can go to a very difficult, challenging school and a rundown facility, or you can go to a nice new school where the students all have strong parental support and motivation. What are you going to do if you make the same money both places? And so, the best schools have the best teachers. That's, that's the, the reality. So what do you do to get them to move? Uh, and the answer in Dallas is offer them ten or fifteen thousand dollars. At some price point, normal people say, "Well, you want you want the money? You need to go do the hard job." Um, and if you do that, the the uh, limited experience we've had, if you do that with just a handful of teachers, the whole school gets better. It, I mean, it's really remarkable. Uh, but make no mistake about it, um, that is going to be strongly resisted by the teachers who don't think they're going to get the, the bonuses um, because they're going to want a cross-the-board raise. But everywhere that's tried this, you give a cross-the-board raise, and basically this, the teachers do better, but the students don't do better. And so the question is, do we want to make the hard choices? And that's why you have to, I agree with Chairman Huberty, you've got to look at this whole this commission as a whole report. If you pull merit pay out and try to pass that, it's not going to work. Like any other, uh, one of the things we discussed was how much should we recommend to the legislature, how much money should be added to the system. I mean, I don't think the way, uh, the way it works with property taxes and state taxes being the main uh, uh, supports for public schools, as property taxes go up, property tax receipts unquestionably have grown, uh, gone, gone up as Texas uh, property values have gone up, the state drop just drops. And um, you can argue about whether the state has ever been, which I don't think it ever has been, the majority support, but, but you can, th there's no great argument for the state should pay less and less for schools every year. So the, so the question is, if we, to get property tax relief, you're going to have to, the state's going to have to kick in some money. But the question that, that people will be asking is, what do I get for it? What do I get for it? If, if the number of students graduating from high school, high school, if it's still like a th two-thirds of them couldn't uh, uh, be drafted in the military, couldn't volunteer for the military, couldn't uh, get a well-paying job, couldn't read enough to be a contributing member of society in the Texas economy rather than a burden on the Texas society and economy. If, if we can move those numbers, then you feel different about that. And the only way to move those numbers, I mean, people incentives matter. People respond to incentives. And in my view, across the board, anything is not an incentive because you get it whether you're good, bad, or indifferent. If I can add one more thing For to that. Sure. So I thought one of the most innovative elements of the commission report that um, the group here proposed was these outcomes-based incentives. So uh, for every student that reaches third grade, liter meets reading level in third grade, uh, and graduates high school, college, career, and military ready, a district will get, new do will get more dollars on day one per student, and it would be equitably weighted. So for a low-income student um, on third grade literacy, it's roughly 30-something, 30 3,500, and then for a non-low-income student, it would be about 1,450, because we know it takes a deeper investment for our low-income students to reach that standard, um, and, and we want to reward districts. I think we're, why I like that idea is uh, there's a lot of variation by level. Uh, as poverty increases, there's a lot of variation in district performance. Um, one example I'll give is Brownsville ISD is a district that is 96% poor. 40% of their kids are reading on grade level. They are actually one of the best performing high poverty districts in the state of Texas. And yet, still six out of 10 kids are not, perform or not reading on grade level. 
That is not because, especially if you compare it to the thousand other districts in, in the state of Texas, that is not because Brownsville is not doing a great job. They are doing the best that they can. They are investing very wisely in early childhood, in teachers, and what this would do is then provide them extra dollars to continue to scale and innovate the practices that are working so that they can go from 40% to maybe 60% in a few years. Um, but we want to be able to find a way to reward districts that, when you, with, that are spending their money and thinking very thoughtfully about how to drive the outcomes we care about, uh, like third grade literacy, because there is not a more high stakes part in your K-12 journey than being able to read by third grade or graduating high school, college, career, and military ready. Does anybody else have a thought on the incentives? There's such an amazing, yeah. Well, I think the incentives are, are huge, uh, teachers as well as for districts. But we're also providing additional funds in the commission's recommendation for comp ed, which compensatory education, which is far lower. And this goes to everyone. So, and it's, right now, I think compensatory ed is 1.2 for every child's lower income. We're changing that to 1.22 or something, I think, for all kids. But then we're also going to go into the intensity of poverty. You understand that a school district that has 80% higher or higher level of poverty within that district is a much more challenging situation than a school district may have 5% or by camp. Well, I think we're doing it by camp. It's by camp. So if you have 5% lower income, those kids are seeing a lot of normal and seeing a lot of possibilities and potential. But if you're in a, a school campus that's you know, 80 85% of the students are low income, they don't have those opportunities. They're not getting the same kind of education just out in the outside world that they are. So recognizing that, we're going to give every school that has those types of students more money to help on that. But we're also going to incentivize them by way of doing some you know, innovative programs. And we're not talking about innovative that you just dream up. These are programs that we know that are working. And we're going to fund programs that actually work and provide those incentives. And frankly, the A through F system is a big part of this. A through F is going to help identify who those schools that are that are high flyers, and frankly, those that are not getting the job done. And I think A through F is going to put a lot of pressure on districts who used to get hide out in the old system. You know, the old system was met standard or improvement required. You all remember that? You know who, who improvement required was? It was the 7th percentile and below. So if you were in the 8th percentile, guess what? You met standard. How many people had pep rallies for met standard if you get in the 8th or 9th percentile? A through F helps us differentiate those. And if you're trending up or trending down, everybody knows it. If you've been a really good school and you start dropping to a B, people are going to start asking questions. There's going to be a lot of pressure put on those districts to get their act together. And if you're moving up, there's going to be a lot more of encouragement. And we've already seen that. The, the positive discussions are already happening. We, just, we rolled out A through F just for district level this past year. And you're already hearing those positive discussions. Because people are now realizing where they are in the spectrum. They're not met standard for everybody from the 8th to the 100th percentile. And they're already starting to ask those very positive questions. Well, what do we need to do to get better? And that's going to promote a lot of this. So a lot of these things are coming into play at the same time. I think we have great opportunities to improve our Texas educational system right now. And I think this School Finance Commission report helps move that forward. You know, and Chair Chairman Taylor brought something up that we went from, because he and I both worked on the A through F bill and cleaning it up last session. Obviously, when you pass legislation, you always figure little tweaks that need to be made. But the prior system to that, and, and I want you to think about this, go look at your school districts. It used to be exemplary, recognized, met standard, or improvement required. How many school districts did you ever walk around or see that would have on the top of their building a recognized school district? You know, it's like a solid B. You know, you wouldn't do that today. You wouldn't, you, would, you know, everybody's trying to get to that achievement level. And I think one of the best examples, um, you know, Houston ISD is, is, you know, had multiple problems over the years, but when they did their presentation and talked to us, you know, they had the, the relief because of, of Harvey, but they did their own math and said, hey, you know, based upon everything that we know, you know, we're pretty proud that we'd be a, a B school district, and, and that's a lot of work and hard work that they went into that. So they're focused on that. They're looking at that and saying, this is important to us. As much as they push back on it, I think the people that are, are succeeding are, are, are wanting to be recognized as a result of that. Wonderful. Well, I really look forward to the discussion about these incentives. They're very novel and interesting and may um, move the needle to improve our student outcomes for sure. Um, Chairman Taylor, a, a tough question for you, and I, I put the slide up. Um, the report recommends that there's a balance between state and local funding for public education. 
But for the state to match local property taxes, so for state revenue or in input to match what the local property taxes are doing to support schools, the state would have to increase spending by many billions of dollars per year. Should taxes be increased to fund the report's recommendations? And what should the state versus local balance be? Well, first of all, taxpayers are the same whether they're paying state or local. They're different pockets and all that. Mm. I think Chairman Brister's already pointed out, I don't think we were ever 50 plus percent from the state level. It is a shared, our, our constitutional system requires a shared system. And I don't think anyone's saying we need to bump it back up to make it 50-50. That's, that's not what the, the system is. Uh, it would be a huge number, but we are trying, what we are talking about is stopping the slide in the state portion. As our state budget is growing, as our population is growing, I don't think it, it's, it's very difficult to defend reducing our share significantly because like I say, what I talked about earlier, the recapture is now, in about 10, 11 years, will surpass the state percentage. And I don't think anyone's going to be putting up with that, particularly those people who live in those districts. Uh, so we've got to make sure we take care of that. It's not about leveling up, but it is about stopping the trend that we're on and make sure the money is going to programs that really work and improve our educational outcomes, recognizing this is the number one thing we do in Texas beyond public safety is the education of our kids. And it does require a commitment. And I will say the state has not shirked this responsibility. If you look at our budget, it has always been the number one budget item in our budget. If you look at state funds and what we spend, it has always been number one. It has dropped over time. It used to be like 62% of our state budget, and now it's about 52. So it's dropped about 10%. But you look at where that money went, health and human services is eating our lunch. More has gone up in health and human services than education has gone down percentage-wise. So we've had other cuts. The rest of the government runs on very little, basically, after you take out health and human services and, and public education. So we have never shirked that responsibility. It's always been number one, but we have to come up with a better system and make sure we keep that regressive trend from, from, from continuing. Does anyone else want to weigh in on the state versus local? No? You know, I, I, would, I would say that, um, you know, for, for those of us that we have to do something with the, the, the tax rate. You have to, and again, you got to look at the entirety of the plan of, of, of you talk about it. You know, we've talked about, you know, do you do a tax swap? Meaning, do you, you know, when you look at a consumption tax versus the, the property tax. I don't think there's anybody in the legislature that's going to sit there and say, oh, yeah, let's go raise taxes and we'll just give the money. Uh, to, to the education system, it's got to. There's got to be a balance of, of how do you how do you achieve that, and the the reality is is that we're taxing people out of their homes, we are, and and it's a significant problem. And so yes, the state share um, because if you think about property growth, property, the TEA did their uh, their LAR, which is how they ask for money. And they assumed a couple things. They assumed property growth or property value growth at about 6.9%. But they also took the $3.5 billion that we as property tax or payers are, are paying into the system and not putting it back in, into, into the system. And we said, you can't continue to do that. It doesn't, it doesn't work. You've got you've to find a way to reduce it um, to, to get there and have meaningful, have meaningful discussions about that. So while I, I believe that the finance system, the school finance plan, as outcomes and expenditures will be moving forward, there'll be similar discussions through the tax policy uh, ways and means or whatever, wherever else is, you, you know, you start figuring out how to, how to do that. But the ultimate goal is to, is to reduce the burden on the local property tax uh, 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 payers today. And I think that we can be very successful and achieve that. If I could add one more thing. Some of the numbers you've heard repeated over and over and in the newspaper are frankly inaccurate. Uh, the Texas Education Association puts out their number, and the Legislative Budget Board puts out their number when they talk about the state funding of education. Let me just tell you why they're different. The Legislative Budget Board only includes foundation school program is the state share. They don't include the cost of administration of TEA. They don't include all the grants that we do beyond the foundation school program. So those numbers are already off two, three, four percent just based on the numbers they use. It's been widely reported, the uh, LBB numbers, but that's a very inaccurate number as far as the state's effort in funding public education. I think it's a disservice that they put that out. They do, in fact, put a little footnote by it at the very bottom of the page, but no one ever reads the footnote. But when you hear these numbers about the state's only doing whatever it is, 30 percent, 
A lot of these things are misnomers based on the numbers that they're using from the LBB. And I just put up the slide, TEA, I, I really applauded them. The Texas Education Agency in their annual report put out data um, that indicated we were spending as a state around $11,000 um, per student or $60 million per year. So um, that was some, some interesting data. Um, Chairman Huberty, I'll mention that the report is not funded um, just, the report is not funded just by new taxes or, or new revenue sources from the state. It's actually funded in part by repurposing billions of dollars of existing school finance um, formula, which with much more money going to districts with low income children. Why is the focus on low income children? And will districts that don't teach low income students lose money as part of these big reallocations of existing funds? You have to recognize that the school finance system really created 1984 uh, was when the, the kind of blueprint was laid out of how it works. And there are certain pieces that are in there. And so, yes, we, we, we got rid of, uh, of things that we didn't think belong, like, you know, we had a hold harmless provision from 1993. Uh, makes no sense. It, you know, helps like 30 school districts. But we also studied cost of education index. Cost of education index is supposed to kind of keep a level playing field. Well. It hasn't been adjusted or addressed since 1990. The Legislative Budget Board, one of their requirements is to study it. Well, they haven't studied it. And so we said, if, if you're not going to do what you're supposed to do, just get rid of it. I mean, there's a lot of things that reallocating resources. And our view is that if you put it into the basic allotment, all ships will rise. But yes, we, we did focus, and, and uh, Chairman Taylor mentioned this, we did focus on like compensatory education where we changed the weighting and we looked at it. But we want the money going to the campuses. That's, that's the critical thing is that it needs to get into those, into those areas where, and it's, and it's not, this is, the, this is the interesting thing. If you think about Dallas and some of these other areas, even though they could be uh, a poor areas or you know uh, the demographics associated with that they can be very high functioning schools um, and 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 so the goal is is not we're not just saying hey we're just going to give money to 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 you know poorly performing campuses we want to incentivize all of those campuses to start rewarding them and that's why we focused on third grade reading and we focused on early education because if you can get the remediation done at a much earlier age guess what you're saving money in the long run. And why not create more incentives on the back end uh, for school districts, you know, so that we, we have incentives. We talked, one of the things we talked about was on the career and college uh, military readiness. You know, do you incentivize, you, do you heavily weight a school district, uh, regardless of where it's at, to incentivize them to graduate more kids with associate's degrees? Because you know what? Those kids then uh, graduate college early, which saves the state money and saves the parents money. I know I've got a freshman who's actually a sophomore because of the amount of credits that she got uh, through the dual credit programs. Those are the kind of programs that we're talking about. And it shouldn't be based on how much money your family makes. It's, it's you know, we're focusing and putting it to the, to the campuses that need it the most. Uh, and that could be a highly, you know, a, a wealthy school district or, you know, a school district that has money that's, that's poorly performing. But it's, again, it's to create the incentives. It's to create the incentives at the campus level, not just for the district level. That's the, that's the key. I want to, if I can, um, uh, I want to acknowledge also we have a changing demographics here in Texas. 60% of the kids in Texas, public education students in Texas are low income students. We've added almost 800,000 students into our public education system over the last roughly 10 years. 80% of that growth are low-income students. The demographics of Texas are changing. Texas tomorrow looks different than the Texas 10 years ago. And so it does take a different type of investment. Now to the question of why, that, why, does a, why do low-income students need uh, you know, a, a different type of investment? I'll give a couple of examples. Um, some of you may have heard about the 30 million word gap. So the idea here is that a, a child by age three uh, is likely, it, from a professional background whose parents went to college and work and are maybe in the upper, upper quartile of income is going to be exposed to 30 million more words by the time they hit age three. So when they're coming into kindergarten or when they're coming into pre-K, they are already, low income students are already coming at a deficit. And that's why there was so much of a focus around fo uh, not only investments for uh, low income students, but also investments in the early grades to help bridge that gap and bring students to grade level so that they can be uh, on that same level as their peers. Thank you. And um, Chairman Huberty, I know that you had mentioned as the report went on um, that the report was focused on helping all of Texas 
and not any one um, particular district. And I thought that that was a great um, mission to lay out because these re reallocations could result in some changes in who's getting um, funding levels. Um, Mr. Desai, something that I care very deeply about <laughs> is student outcomes. Um, and improving them, and the report does a, a tremendous amount to try and incent those things. Um, but one of the things I found really remarkable is that the report actually encourages local school boards to adopt third grade reading and high school graduation goals. And I know you have some um, experience with adopting those goals. What are your goals, and what data do you use to measure progress, and how do you report that progress publicly? Well, I think uh, to the point about goals, it goes back to what uh, Chairman Brister said at the beginning, that when we're talking about increased investments in public education, it's for what? Um, so at the end of the day, being able to clearly state what the goals are, uh, make a, it, it helps us understand where we're trying to go and what we're trying to in invest in and what are the strategies uh, a district or a state need to be investing in to reach those goals. Um, the, uh, real quick, in Dallas ISD, they just passed a tax ratification election, so um, increasing their proper uh, their taxes from a dollar four to a dollar seventeen, um, and that's basically a thirteen cent tax increase, which is about one hundred and fifty million dollars. Um, sixty, per, roughly sixty percent of which was paid for by local businesses because uh, they pay for the property taxes. Uh, the business community saw the growth in Dallas ISD, saw the great work that was happening in Dallas ISD, saw that Dallas ISD had very clearly articulated ways that they wanted to invest these new dollars, that uh, they helped fund the campaign to effectively raise their taxes. I think that goes back to that if you, if, when Dallas ISD was clearly able to set its goals and say, for all across all of our standard, all of our star tests, we want to reach. 60% to 75% by 2025. That's not the exact goal, but just to be illustrative about what was what the conversation that was happening. Dallas ISD said that they wanted to reduce the achievement gaps between low income and non low income students. That they wanted to establish a certain number of early college high schools. That they wanted to make sure that X percent of students would enroll in a quality after school or extracurricular program. But setting those goals is what sets the template for what types of investments need to follow that. Um, and to the question of how do we then continue to work, I think one of the things as commit, uh, we try to serve as a continuous improvement partner to, to districts. So our regional scope is Dallas County and some other parts of North Texas. Uh, we partner with every, with every district, every college, nonprofit, foundations, and corporations. But our real goal is to use data so we can make better decisions for kids every single day. And so I think the more that districts have the ability or, or to either f create their own or partner with uh, a, a, an organization to help them develop that continuous improvement capacity to look at their data to figure out what's working, what's not, what can we learn from other districts across the state, um, and what can we start, stop, continue, like any high-functioning organization could do, that it will go a long way to reach the goals that we're talking about. And it also then helps us understand what types of funding we need to be focused on, um, both at the state level and the local level. Great. Um, I, I really will admire and encourage our school boards to consider adopting meaningful goals. Um, and I very much appreciate that you mentioned that you look at student star results and A through F in, in having your goals. And I know that Commit to Dallas puts a lot of their information online about how their schools are doing. So very transparent with, par transparent with parents and taxpayers on what's happening in the district. And um, I think the report says we need to set a true North Star and then m try to move our children toward it. And that, that was a great um, thing to mention. Um, Chairman Taylor, the report recommends that school districts be incented to spend money on certain things, but school districts sometimes complain that they want less strings attached to funding and more local control. Why should the legislature put strings on the funding that's coming? Well, I think the state government should do state government and local should do local until the locals aren't getting the job done. And we have some cases where the local districts have not gotten the job done. The state has stepped in. We've increased, we, I'm sorry, we've shortened the time frame when the state will step in and help correct failing districts uh, to the level now where we, we've had a lot of large districts that were able to hide poor performing campuses in their overall rating. And so we've stepped in and said, no, you, you can't be 
considered a really good district unless all your campuses are doing well. And we've already seen that change in focus. Now they're working on every campus. I got five minutes, okay. Where every campus <laughs> does well. The other thing is the incentives. We're not making you do it, but if you do it, we'll give you more money for it. If you'll get a lower income kid to pass those, those tests and be college career ready, we're gonna give you more money. So that's not exactly, we're not telling them how to do it. Even the teacher incentive program, we're allowing them to create their local program. If you create one that looks like it'll work, has to be approved by the commissioner, we'll give you more money for that. These are things that are proven to work. And frankly, if you're doing a great job in your, your district, I don't think this report does anything to you. We don't get in your way and tell you how to do something and all that. We're leaving flexibility, but at some point, the state has to step in when a local district is not doing the job that they need to be getting done. And unfortunately, that's happened in a number of our campuses across the state. And those are kids seeing those classrooms that deserve as good of education as anybody else in this state. And frankly, there's more of those kids today. And if we don't get them educated, if we don't make that a priority one, our state will not continue to be the leader. So these are things we have to do. And yes, sometimes we will have to step in and, and help the local district to make the right decisions if they're not doing it on their own. And I think A through F and a number of other things we've done will help us already set the stage, make sure we're prepared to do the types of things that need to be done. Chairman Huberty, I know that you've been a huge champion of pre-K, and I wanted to ask, um, there wasn't a specific allotment for um, pre-K in the report, to my knowledge. What are your thoughts about schools um, spending on high-quality pre-K programs, given that it wasn't a, a real specific recommendation in the report? Yeah, I think the uh, the misnomer had always been uh, when we originally passed House Bill Four back in the uh, eighty four session. Uh, there was there was a lot of pushback. There was some pushback uh, associated with it. Uh, but we spend right now nine hundred billion dollars or nine hundred million dollars a year uh, on pre K today. Uh, but it was never a quality. It wasn't aligned to the teaks. It wasn't. It was. It was. You know, to to some degree. Um, you know, some could criticize it for being, you know, daycare uh, or whatever it was. Um, so a couple things that we did right now, you know, we're not, you know, we, do we think it should be available to every child? Yes, we, we think it should be. Um, and right now we're limited, about 50% of the population actually qualifies for that. So not everybody qualifies uh, to, to have that program. But it has to be robust. It has to be aligned with the TEKS. And the one thing that we learned is that, that and, and I think Chairman Taylor mentioned this, is that, you know, the, the families that have the means to be able to put their children in some sort of uh, Montessori school or pre-K program, those children do obviously much better. Uh, and the results are much better uh, for them when, when we start looking at their vocabulary and how they read and, and, and all those, those very important things that, as they start their careers. But the question we struggle with is, you know, how much, how much do you, how much resources do you really put in? What is the right number? Where do we, where do we go forward? And so that will be part of the discussion we have as we go through this legislative process of how do we define that? Because if you just said, hey, we want to pay for a full day of pre-K for everybody, we'll double that. That's nine hundred million dollars more. That's not even expanding the groups that are out there. One of the things that we did in House Bill 4, and I know there's, we're very short in time, this is really the important thing, I think, and people never, I don't know if people really understood this when we did this. You actually can partner with private providers as well. So you have the ability to partner with the Montessori schools, the school districts do, to, to create that incentive. And that was a bill that I carried and we passed. And, and I think it's important because what people don't understand is that, and, and the superintendents that, that have embraced it, my old superintendent, one of the things he said, he embraced it. And he said, because those are all, the majority, are all going to be my kids anyways. So why not incentivize and create those, those partnerships now and take advantage of that. Unfortunately, very few school districts did that, have done that. Um, and so I think those will be some of the incentives that we want to see is creating that opportunity um, to, to incentivize these, these, these schools and these, these to, to work more collaboratively together. I think that, that will be a huge, huge thing for us. And if I can just close that out, like I, I think the, I mean, the report does provide the funding for districts to have the option to do so, uh, because it is, it can be, it's probably the closest thing to a silver bullet we have, although it alone is not a silver bullet. However, um, a lot of districts, for various reasons, capacity constraints, maybe they can't get the teaching workforce or the lack of parental interest, may not be able to make that investment. And so it, this provides, back to the tie and get to the question around um, local autonomy, it gives districts the local ability to make that decision about whether or not they can and should offer a full day, a full day pre-K. Um, but I think the, the, the way to do that then is to make sure that there is enough funding available to, um, to do so, which 
the extra investment in K through three uh, for comp compensatory education gets there. And I would just say the incentive for reading at grade level in, by third grade takes that into account. We, we heard that a lot of schools hire their best teachers in third grade. Well, that's kind of late. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, up to third grade, you're learning how to read. From third grade on, you're reading to learn. So if we haven't got them at grade level, that's why grade three is so important in reading. So providing that incentive that they get more money to get those kids reading in third grade, that provides the incentives to do pre-K and those types. And, and frankly, have good teachers in first and second grade as well. Because you can't just have good pre-K and then go through a lull for first and second and then hope they're going to pop back up for third grade. Because we have seen that too. Good pre-K requires good follow-up. Mm -hmm. So these incentives provide those districts the, the money that's necessary to make those things happen to get them up there. Because that's where it starts, right there. Okay. It's now time for our question and answer. Um, oh, from. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, so would love to take some questions from the um, audience. Uh, some will be walking around with a microphone. Um, please keep your questions succinct. We just have a few more minutes with these um, state leaders, and I want to make sure we get in as many questions as possible. So with that, I think we have a question right here. Uh, yes, uh, my question is, uh, American students have never done well when it comes to outcomes. I mean, even back in the 70s and 80s when I was in school, our teachers told us that, you know, the Japanese kids were scoring so much higher on test scores and pretty soon Jap Japan was going to basically kick our butt economically. But that never happened. And in fact, the Texas economy is one of the strongest in the entire nation. I think 25% of all jobs created in the last 10 years have been here in Texas. And yet our students are not scoring anywhere near the highest. I mean, they have, according to this flyer here that's on this chair, we're 28th in the nation when it comes to outcomes. I'm not actually arguing here for ignorance, but I guess my, my point is if there's no strong correlation between student achievement outcomes and a strong economy, you know, and, and we know that more taxes and more money thrown at the problem, that will hurt the Texas economy. I'm very concerned that if we keep arguing that, you know, the sky is falling like we have for the last 35 years, that's going to have a much more negative income, outcome on, on our Texas economy than, than worrying about American students' test scores, which have never been that good, if you look at them worldwide. Responses? Well, well, first of all, I would agree the American way has been far better. Our students are much more well-rounded. But what you have to recognize is our demographics have changed dramatically, and the educational outcomes of our particular minorities and our English language learners and our lower in, uh, income students are far lower than, all, than our other students. And that demographic is totally turned upside down. The, the classroom that you and I were in, I can't tell how old you are, you said 70s and 80s, is far different today. And there's a huge difference between the educational outcomes between the majority that we had back then and the majority we have today. So you can't ignore that. If their out educational outcomes are that much lower, that will affect how we do. Now, we still led the country. I, you know, people talk about our educational system. Yeah, we put man on the moon with that. But I'm not sure if we continue on the path we are today, 10 years from now, those people could put the pe people back on the moon. So we have to recognize the change in demographics and make sure that every child gets back to where we were and, and, and above that. We're also in a more global, economic, competitive environment than we were back then. You know, our oceans were big barriers back in the day. We could, we could do things here, but now we're having jobs going here, there, and people are deciding where to locate. So it's much more uh, more uh, competition all the way across the board. So we have to be mindful of what's going on. I'm not for some of those other educational systems where they go to school for 10 hours a day, they don't have any kind of a break. Those are not well-rounded students. They don't, they don't react well to changing conditions. They're almost machine-like. Well, we, we can't afford that in our country, but we do have to recognize there are changing demographics that have changed, and we've got to recognize that. Yeah, I mean, 11, we, uh, Georgetown did a study uh, and they said that since the recession in 2008, we've added about 11.6 million jobs 
11.5 million of those jobs required some form of a post-secondary education. Now that could be a four-year degree, it could be a two-year degree, it could be a vocational certificate, um, but that workforce need exists. I'd even argue here in Texas, our employers see that. Um, I know we work really closely with the regional chambers up in North Texas, and a lot of businesses, they've done a great job bringing the businesses here, and then the businesses come here and say, well, we don't, where's the educated workforce? So now they're having to pay wage premiums to bring people from outside the state, but in many cases also to bring people from outside the country. So what we're just doing is we're filling the gap that exists, um, and we continue to have nearly 200,000 high school graduates every single class that leave K-12 and do not get a post-secondary degree within six years. And from a, from a very simplistic uh, political point of view, the thing that turns people into Republicans is paying a lot of taxes. If, if they're making a high income and they have to pay a lot of taxes, then they start saying, I don't like that. The thing that turns people into Democrats is receiving a lot of benefits. So the question is, what do we want our school system to, spin out, uh, to spit out, Republicans or Democrats? <laughs> I'll just add that um, upwards of 70% of our children, economically disadvantaged children, don't read by third grade. And I think the report is focused on early literacy skills, it's hard to argue um, against trying to improve those outcomes. Um, microphone, yes, right up here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, I've had the uh, interesting thing of doing, having my own small research project going on on uh, the relationship between uh, public, private, and homeschooling because I've got three sets of grandchildren and three of those, one of each of those. And the outcomes of my grandchildren, who are all college age or beyond, beyond now, very much verifies the national research done on that, where the uh, very best is the homeschooling, the medium is the public schools, and the worst, I mean the medium is the private schools, and the worst is the public schools. And uh, my question for you is that this was all based on uh, uh, in incentives for out regarding positive outcomes for public schools, which I think is highly commendable, what, what you're doing, what you're working on. But what is being done with incentives for positive outcomes on choice of school systems? No one's picking well, up the microphone. We'd have to. <laughs> yeah, I'm not running for anything, so I'll. I'll just, so uh, school choice was not one of our tasks. Um, we were, uh, this is a commission on public school finance. We looked at public school finance. Now you can say, uh, you know, there is charters, there's various ways that uh, public, uh, where public and private schools bleed together. Uh, but we didn't uh, tackle that, so I'll let one of the people that are trying to get elected uh, address school choice. <laughs> well, I'm a believer in choice. Uh, I think competition is great. It works in all aspects of our economy. It improves the outcomes for everyone. Um, right now, our, our focus is getting the public school system on the right track uh, to make sure they're doing as well as they could be doing. But I think we should have those options available for some students in some parts of the state. Um, that's not going to be the focus this session, I think. It will not be part of the school finance uh, bill, I don't believe, because we've got to get that done. We can't have that held up with some other discussions. But I am a believer in school choice, and we will have those discussions later. But right now, we've got to get this. This is the, the huge bill of the session, is school finance. And we, we have to get it done. I've already told you the story about recapture, some of the other things that are going on. We have to make sure the school finance gets done and gets done correctly. Um, thank you very much for the work that you did. I noticed at the beginning, the, the report and a lot of the tweaks that you talked about all have a basis in the idea of, of choice and free market tweaks to the system, right? This is my concern. And, and uh, Chairman Taylor, you, you talked about the explosive growth of just one elementary school, right? Powerfully demonstrating the ability of free market thought to triumph over old, rehashed, potato soup socialism, right? You can't sow 
you know, new cloth on old cloth, or it's going to rip. You can't put new wine into an old wine skin. Jeremy Huber said this school system started in 1984, where it's coming out of this round robin hood socialist thing. Why isn't a recommendation? Because I scanned the report briefly. To even right now, I didn't see anything about breaking down school districts and letting low-income parents move their portable public school funds into another public school. Because even recently, you know, as doing family law, I've seen you know, school districts saying that you have to stay in this district, you need special permission to go somewhere else. And as I look at Section 1, Article 7, it says public schools. It doesn't say boundaried schools. So, so as you're doing all these free market tweaks to what is in essence a, a, a socialist recapture system, why not just make the funds portable and destroy that completely? The, the, the ability to do that exists statutorily today. School districts have to take the opportunity to do that. One of the things that was brought to our attention is we, we passed uh, a couple sessions ago what they call the districts of innovation. And there's a lot of different components that you can pick and choose uh, that makes you a district of innovation. Um, there's been some very creative schools and superintendents and school boards that are out there that can take advantage of that, like the home rule school rule. Um, that you can that you that you can try to pass to be able to effectively operate as a charter school district, right? Those those exist in statute today. It just becomes a situation where you know, do the schools want to take that as as an option? Secondarily, yeah, I, I think that the the question becomes this: if you have low performing students and you have built out schools in Kingwood, Texas, as an example, which is I represent that area probably some of the best schools in the state, in north part of Kingwood. You go down to Humble Elementary, which is the very same school district, and you say, we want to move all the, you know, the parents want to be able to have that opportunity to go, to go someplace else. But those, that school district in particular has been very creative in putting the IB program at Humble High School versus at Kingwood High School and creating magnet programs within their schools. So we give them a lot of flexibility and I think what Chairman Taylor has said is that, you know, we want them to be able to control their, their elected officials, too. Those are school board members that run for office and get elected and have the flexibility and ability to, to be very creative. And so what our, our plan was simple. I, and I think we unanimously voted for it with, with you know, with, with, the, with the chairman's leadership. We said that the system as we know it today is not working. It's not being, it's not functioning correctly. We know that, and we're just, we've always tried to just kind of nip around the edges to fix this system, this socialist system. And so I, I, I assure you that as we go forward, the additional resources that we're talking about putting in uh, for outcomes-based solutions and things of that, very creative type programs, I think we're gonna get the results that, that we're gonna wanna see. But it's incumbent upon these schools to take advantage of that. And if I was a smart superintendent and I was a smart school board, I would look at this report and say, I'm gonna embrace every single one of these ideas because it could make you a, you know, a unbelievable um, uh, school district and provide a, a fantastic opportunity uh, for, for, the, for the children out there and be collaborative and, and that's, that's really what the goal is. And if I could add one more thing. <clears throat> If you look at it, 9% of our students are going to be in public education. 9%. We, we have states have had public school choice, or school, sorry, school choice for 30 years, and it's still about 90% of the kids are in the public school system. So once again, you've got to hit priorities in order. The first thing we have to do is get our public school system in order. And then we can talk about some of these other things for, for a smaller group of students. When you're talking about 5.4 million students, that's a big onus on us to get that done right for 90% of those kids. And yes, I want those options for the other ones, but right now I've got to get this done, and then we'll work our way down through the priorities. Does that make sense as far as the numbers? We're, just, we're dealing with a huge problem at the state level, and the vast majority of our kids are in that system. And even, even states have had the school choice for numerous years are still at that about 90% of the students. So we've got to take care of that as our number one priority. Any other thoughts? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, my name is Terry Leo. I was on the State Board of Education for 10 years. I just retired from Klein ISD, so I've been both a teacher and from the administrative end. Um, Mr. Desai, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, um, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, while I agree 100% with you that 
the outcome and student success is directly and intrinsically le linked to the teacher. Um, I am worried, I guess, being part of the system, that it will get to the right places um, and to the right teachers. Um, I have special education teachers who are fabulous, who are some of my strongest teachers. They have the most challenging learners. They're probably, some of them, are not going to be able to pass the state assessment test, even though they're an excellent teacher. So, um, can you, Kara, can you go back to that chart where he, where uh, Mr. Desai showed the increase um, in teacher merit pay um, and, and student outcome? Right here. Okay. I'm not sure this is the best argument for that, so I want you to kind of make that for me. The state um, meeting state standards also went up at the same time as Dallas went up. So I see where you've made some gain, but how significant is it a gain? And how is that translated to other districts that are demographically like Dallas, like Houston ISD? Um, I just, uh, I don't know if that's the best chart to show that you had the increase. So make your case to me. Um, and then also can you kind of address how would you put that in the hands of the school district and so that it's not political, so that it really does get to your strongest teachers? Okay. Um, so I, I think that I'll first say I, I do believe that is a pretty significant gr uh, closing the gap. So going from down 12% to down about 6 so almost uh, it's roughly 13% with rounding, but from 13% to 7% in four, effectively four full school years um, and implementing a series of reforms for a district that is 50% more poor than the state. Is, is, is certainly very significant. Um, and then the last part that I will say is the improvement required schools to go from 43 to four schools, a 90% decline in four years is a very quick turnaround. And, it sh and you can see it in the demonstrated growth. Um, you know, to the point, I think that there has been a lot of research about our teacher evaluation systems effective or not. Uh, it's really important that we look at fidelity of implementation. So the Gates Foundation did a study of different teacher evaluation systems, merit pay systems across the country. They found a couple of things to be really important. One is that it had to be multiple measures. It couldn't just focus on test scores. It couldn't just be about observations. Second is that it had to be differentiated. And so um, sometimes when merit pay systems were implemented in other parts of the country, uh, they tended to be similar to what we saw with our uh, accountability system, where 90% were ranked as met standard. And so a teacher evaluation system has to be sufficiently differentiated to really identify who your top teachers are, who your average teachers are, who your progressing teachers are. Um, and then the last part is then that system should be used to place our um, most effective teachers in the most challenged schools. So Chairman Taylor talked a little bit about Blanton ISD and the growth that they saw. There are 20 schools that Dallas ISD has done that with, um, with significant and meaningful gains, uh, with in increasing or large stipends to help move teachers there. But those three components and what kind of the Gates Foundation found in terms of what have been effective models to lift student outcomes, um, examples in DC, uh, in the Dallas ISD example, those are the things that w really have lifted up as effective components of any evaluation system. Now to the question about are those going to the teachers? Um, at the end of the day, the, the ACE program, which Chairman Taylor was referring to, was the critical factor, um, was the critical factor was making sure that teachers were getting that investment. So they polled teachers to said, how much would it cost to move a teacher? They said somewhere between eight to $10,000, and principals got somewhere about a, about a ten to $15,000 stipend to do the same. Um, and so that is a direct way that teachers are getting those dollars. Um, and at the end of the day, with things like a teacher evaluation system in place and teachers getting rewarded for that and getting paid more for that, um, you're seeing a lot of teachers stay in Dallas ISD because they're getting paid better for the impact that they're making. Unfortunately, we are um, out of time. I wanted to say personally to this wonderful group, they spent almost a year working very hard on this report. It came up with um, what I think are, as mentioned, some free market and, and novel and interesting ways to try to ensure our children are reading and graduating high school ready. 
Um, and I look forward to the session and your continued leadership on this issue. But on behalf of the children of the state of Texas, thank you for your hard, hard work. I have one more um, quick announcement. Um, if anybody would like to participate in a TP TPPF video about our policy orientation and what you learned at this panel, please go to meeting room 412 right now. And thank you so much.